survival of people and wildlife depends on the health of the land. But our demand for resources is destroying the land and all it harbors. Our consumption of the Earth's natural reserves has increased by 50% in the last 30 years. With overuse, mismanagement and climate change, a third of the planet's land has become severely degraded. Each year, we lose 15 billion trees and 24 billion tons of fertile soil. And at least 10,000 species become extinct. The land we live on is being strained to breaking point. Restoration and conservation are key to its survival. I'm Juliana Schatz in Guayaquil, Ecuador, where an innovative device is helping to protect the forest from expansion and exploitation from the city. And I'm Rachel Hocking in Western Australia, where an ancient culture is leading the way in protecting a unique desert wilderness. Located in southern Ecuador, Cerro Blanco is one of the last remaining dry forests in the country. Threatened by the expanding city, illegal settlements, hunting and poaching, the forest is in critical danger of extinction along with its native wildlife. Ecuadorian dry forests are incredibly biodiverse habitats. Yet due to human activity, they have been reduced to just 1% of their original coverage. I have traveled here to see how listening devices made from recycled technology could help protect the forest and its endangered wildlife. The population of Guayaquil has increased tenfold over the last 60 years and is now home to nearly 2 million people. Drawn here by employment opportunities, migrants are often only able to afford to live on the outskirts, which have now spread within the boundaries of the Cerro Blanco Reserve. I'm heading into the forest to meet the people who are conserving this protected area. Don Perfecto is the reserve's chief ranger. Yo soy el Euterio Perfecto Jaguar de la Cruz para servirle. Mucho gusto. He has been working to protect the forest for over 20 years, but this has become increasingly difficult. ¿Qué es este bosque tan único? Cuando ingrese al campo, ¿qué ha sentido? La brisa. La brisa, ¿qué más? El aire fresco. El oxígeno. Que esa es lo que nosotros llamamos el pulmón de Guayaquil. El único. ¿Qué es lo que usted ve al frente, vea? Wow, la edificación. Cogieron solares por donde más lo pudieron o lo dieron y, y por eso ahí donde usted ve ya no caminó para allá, solo de ahí para acá y ahí se ha detenido. Where the rangers have managed to stop the city moving further into the forest, they still have to deal with criminal activity such as land trafficking, illegal logging, and hunting. Las amenazas más grandes para el Cerro Blanco en este momento son cuáles? Una, cacería. Y dos, tala de árbol. Simplemente tiene un guardián allí o tiene otro más allá. Entonces, cuando ya ve que el, el guardaparque pasó para su casa, Tiene libre el campo, corta el árbol que quiere y, y arrastra y se lleva. ¿Y los cazadores qué? Es allí donde ahora lo veo difícil. ¿Por qué? Porque ellos andan armados y nosotros no cargamos armas. Este frente que ve aquí es invasión. The rangers not only protect the forest, but the native wildlife that inhabits it. Hola, ¿cómo Hola, están? ¿cómo está? Hola, Hola, Juliana, Armando, soy Armando. A ranger here for 11 years. For the past three, Armando has been fighting to protect one of Cerro Blanco's most iconic birds. Caseta jaguar. Nosotros aquí controlamos, cuidamos los papagayos. Deforestation and hunting has left the great green macaw in critical danger. Conservation programs have been successful in increasing their numbers in captivity, but it is thought that there are now less than 10 left in the wild here in Cerro Blanco. These macaws were recently released and still need support from the rangers. The rangers are doing their best to stop all illegal activity in the forest. 
But with 60 square kilometers to patrol and armed men to face, it's a big and dangerous job for just nine of them. It's especially difficult for them to see or hear when somebody is trespassing illegally. But there's a new technology on hand to help that out. Engineer Topher White has developed Rainforest Connection, a surveillance system consisting of an old mobile phone, external microphone, and recycled solar panel shards, which listens in on the sounds of the forest. Hey, hi, Juliana. I'm Topher. Nice to meet you. Hi. 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 James. Nice, nice to meet you. Topher, why are these listening devices important? It's not really feasible for the rangers themselves to walk around and, and patrol the entire place. Um, but noise travels pretty well through the forest, and so we can put these, uh, these devices up in the trees, these guardians that can listen to the forest and, and pick out all sorts of stuff like chainsaws or, or, or gunshots or even just animal noises. The guardian devices, how do they work? What are they made of? So these are basically old cell phones that people send to us. We put them up in trees, and uh, they can last for years. They listen to the forest, and we can pick out anything we're looking for. We're about to go up the tree right now, and Uncle join me up there, and we can see how it all sort of comes together up top. Yeah, I'd love that. Yeah. I mean, it's a far way up, but I think I can manage. No, you got it. I'm winch it up to you. Okay, if, if it's working. Okay, I'm ready. Right. Ready. Let's do this. Okay. Only slightly scary. Let's take a look at the view. It's stunning. Wow, so these are the little solar panels. These panels are ones that we had to build out of recycled shards. Uh, they're lined up here to be able to make use of sunlight under a tree canopy. How many guardians do you have in Cerro Blanco? Uh, so there are uh, 10 in Cerro Blanco right now. And just we'll in more. different locations around? Just in different locations. And because the microphones are pretty sensitive, we can pick up uh, a lot that happens within a pretty broad area. All of this data is streaming up to a server that we have through this antenna that we have mounted up here at the top. Wow. And uh, we stream that over the standard cell phone network, which even out here in the forest is pretty good. Even our conversation right now is uh, is being uh, is being streamed through the Rainforest Connection system. I can even open up our app and we can listen to ourselves. So this is That's so weird. Just a little higher up is the unit containing the phone that these solar panels charge. Uh, right so there's here. a cell phone inside, and that's a little there's, microphone. Yeah. We're trying to make sure that we're using what's in the country already to to allow this thing to grow. So we're using the existing cell phone service. Uh, we're using Ecuadorian cell phones. Um, and eventually, we're hoping uh, very soon that these rangers themselves can build these phones and put them up themselves. They're the ones who are going to protect the forest. We're just here to provide them some extra tools that help them find what they're looking for. Uh, I just saw lightning. OK. You saw lightning? Yeah. You saw lightning. With a storm brewing, it's time to make a quick exit from the treetop. The next day, I find out exactly how this device can help stop the illegal activity in the forest. So uh, you get these, uh, these alerts over SMS, and in there it says the time, uh, what type of alert, and the location. It was a link, so you can open it up. Um, and then you can start seeing all this on a map. There's far more macaws and Amazon parrots, and there were only a few chainsaws, which is kind of what we would expect. OK. So you can find us. Oh, yeah. All right. Topher and I are today's illegal loggers. Armed with our chainsaw, we want to check the ranges are able to find us using the device, which can cover an area of three square kilometers. So tell me a little bit about how this works. I mean, how do they know what's a chainsaw? We train this artificial intelligence model that, uh, that we built. We give it a, a little bit of uh, hints, so to speak, this training data, and it can pick out uh, what we're looking for from there on forward. OK, let's give it a go. He's gonna take his chainsaw away. <laughs> <laughs> when people are caught, their chainsaws or guns will be confiscated, and they could face jail time or be fined up to a quarter of a million dollars. Este, y 
¿Cómo les ha ido con los, los bases? Para todos nosotros es algo nuevo, pero muy, muy importante. Escuchamos un tiro o una motosierra. Y ahí mismo se sí, pueden ir. Claro. Porque hasta ahora tienen que estar ahí claro, para escucharlo. Sí, ajá. ¿Verdad? Sí. The Rainforest Connection devices are relatively new to Cerro Blanco, but they have already had great success in Sumatra and Cameroon in stopping illegal loggers and poachers. The world has lost nearly half its forests through human activity. Simple and sustainable, these guardians may be able to make a real difference to the forests and wildlife that lives within them. Armando takes me to one of the critical locations for the listening device, one of the few nesting places in the forest for the great green macaws. Estamos llegando al punto del valle de los valle de los pijillos. This is stunning. Y ya cuando nosotros encontramos un nido, tenemos que estar ahí porque la gente ya cuando están en pichón tumban el el pijillo y lo cogen y lo venden. Nosotros tenemos entendido que el papagayo ya se está extinguiendo y, y a la vez es un símbolo el papagayo guayaquil. Y uno con más razón trabaja con más esmero en cuidar, proteger lo que es la reserva. With the global population increasing, the rush to use and exploit our finite natural resources is set to intensify. But it isn't just the environment that's suffering. Since 2015, at least 447 land and environmental defenders have been killed globally. That's more than four people each week. In the Philippines alone, nearly 100 activists have lost their lives since 2010 while trying to protect the land. Meanwhile, in Honduras, more than 120 people died during the same period, including the country's most prominent indigenous environmental leader, Berta Cáceres, who, having campaigned against the construction of a dam, was murdered in her own home in March 2016. Fellow activist Gustavo Castro was with her that day. He was interviewed by Al Jazeera's fault lines. De repente se oye un ruido muy fuerte. En ese momento yo dije, ya entraron los sicarios por nosotros. Yo escuchaba el pa, 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 los tres balazos contra Berta. Voy a su habitación y la encuentro ten, tendida en el, en el piso. Todo lleno de sangre. Quizás no pasó un minuto ¿no? en que ella murió. No, fue muy rápido. Pues yo quiero creer que va a haber justicia porque no es la única hay cantidad de compañeros y compañeras presos, torturados, perseguidos y defendiendo los territorios es el trabajo más peligroso que hay Up to 65% of the land on the planet is managed by indigenous peoples and communities and yet it's estimated that less than 20% is legally owned by them with these vulnerable environments increasingly becoming a battleground, the fight to protect them has never been more important. Australia is one of the most biodiverse countries on Earth, and for tens of thousands of years, its land has been skillfully managed by its first peoples. Traditional small-scale burning was an integral part of maintaining the ecosystem. Since colonisation, many Indigenous people have been forced off their land. In their absence, large wildfires have moved in, aggravated by climate change and rising temperatures. I'm in Western Australia, where the traditional owners are returning to their ancestral lands, rekindling ancient practices to protect one of the largest and most intact arid ecosystems in the world. For tens of thousands of years, a vast area of the Western Desert was home to the Madu people. Some of them were contacted by Europeans as late as the 1960s, and they were cleared off their land. Since then, enormous wildfires have devastated the landscape, with around 18 animal species disappearing from the area. 
On my way to the desert, I'm stopping off to meet Gareth Cass, an expert on how fire has affected Matu country. Have there been any particularly bad fires in recent years on Matu country? The biggest fires have been somewhere in the order of two and a half million hectares. This is a composite image taken over 10 nights and it shows some of the fires in the Western Desert. This fire is emitting more light than Sydney. Yeah, these, these are mega fires, these are extreme events. We're seeing these huge events where there's a lot of rain over summer, lots of grass growth, and then you end up with a landscape that's entirely flammable and ignite with the first lightning strikes of the, the oncoming storms in the next summertime. Left unchecked, this sort of thing will only get worse. So how important is it to have Māru on country? Oh, it's vital for this landscape. With the interaction of people with the desert has entirely shaped the ecosystem there. The solution to these destructive wildfires is, surprisingly, fire. Mardu traditional burning, practised for millennia, is now being brought back to the land. In 2002, the Mardu won native title over their land. Good morning. And they have since started a ranger program, a key part of which is continuing this ancient practice. Morning. Morning. Dry season has just begun, so I'm joining one group as they go deep into Mardu country for two days to start their fire program before wildfires can take hold. Ready, Ready to go. <laughs> Ready to go. <laughs> going. I'm Indigenous too, from Walpree country. I spent part of my childhood in a remote community northeast of here. So I'm looking forward to getting back out to the desert. Carol Williams has been a ranger here for the last five years. What made you want to be a ranger? Well, to learn more Maru culture. Did you know about these things before you became a ranger? Uh, not really, but I learned from Waka. Waka is one of the relatively few Aboriginal elders left who remembers using fire to hunt during his bushman days. His intricate knowledge of the landscape means he can show the younger rangers how and where to burn to keep the land healthy. I got a bit of flame. So you okay. just like tap it and walk and tap it again and watch out. Oh, oh watch out. Oh, sorry. Oh, watch out. Sorry. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this traditional method forms thousands of small clear patches that can prevent large wildfires from taking hold. <laughs> How does lighting fire stop fire? If we make a fire like this, we're making a fire break. So lightning strikes and it might start a big bushfire. So by the time that bushfire gets here, it just stops. Yeah. And it doesn't spread so far. Yeah. With no Mardu, there's no fire breaks. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. The rangers only burn when it's cool. And as the vegetation is still green from the rains, this small fire will soon go out. <laughs> It crawled off because of the fire. Yeah. Their eyes are so in tune with what to look for on this land. Once areas have been burnt, they provide a diverse mix of habitats that can serve the native flora and fauna. The regrowth in this small burnt patch provides perfect foraging grounds and the rangers now map and monitor the animals here. This is the baby. It's got a bushy tail, big ears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Australia has the worst rates of mammal extinction in the world. Like other animals, the bilby, a small nocturnal marsupial, has been in decline since the mardu left the land. The rangers now map and monitor population numbers using GPS trackers and camera traps. There, see, behind, there's a bilby hole there. Really? See the tracks there from last night? I might put the camera there so we can keep on um, counting how many bilbies we find. What's over here? And this is a wood tomato. What was the name again in Maru? Wamula. That's good. Great. Now we've got a bit of bush tucker, it's time to set up camp for the night. Oh, <laughs> Cook up some kangaroo tails. Yeah. Do it like this, eh? I used to just sit back and watch my aunties do it. <laughs> but we can eat them because there's so many of them all over our country. Did the Māori ever eat bilby? Tomorrow, we're going to head out to monitor another of the endangered species here, the black-flanked rock wallaby. The rangers don't always work alone in their conservation of the wildlife here on Mardu country. One of their partners is Alicia Whittington from Parks and Wildlife who's been working with the rangers for the past five years. Hey, Alicia. Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. You too. I'm Rachel. Today we're going to put some rock wallaby traps up in these hills. Sounds good. Yeah. At risk of extinction, in the past few years, black-flanked rock wallabies have been found in several new locations on Mardu country. Alicia, who told you that they were rock wallabies here? I was lucky enough to Walker to come out and say this exact spot. So Walker told you they were yeah. here. Being able to work with people like Walker, who, who know the country so well, really helps us out. These traps will enable the rangers to monitor the health and genetic diversity of this wallaby population. Owen's just found some scats. So that's wallaby poo? Yeah. And that's a good sign? Yeah, good sign, yeah. For rock wallabies, large-scale wildfires burning over these ranges really takes its toll on the animals, so a, a really good fire program is really important. And um, the country's so much healthier because Matu are all managing the land. Jared manages to recover a camera trap, which could show whether a healthy population of rock wallabies is persisting here, thanks in part to the continuation of traditional mardu burning in the area. And then boom, too. Wow. That's incredible. Look at that <laughs> one, it's right up close. <laughs> <laughs> Since Māru have returned to the desert, in areas where they're burning, the overall size and intensity of wildfires have reduced dramatically. But the Māru aren't alone. There are over 100 Indigenous ranger groups across Australia, helping to restore over 67 million hectares of land. When you're out here and you see people like Waka lighting fires, you see the rangers caring for the endangered species, you understand that without them, this country is not going to survive. It's made me think about my own country. It's something that's hard to articulate, you know, that connection that Aboriginal people have to their home country. And it's really brought that home for me. <laughs> The serious consequences of destroying our land are prompting the development of new methods of conservation. This drone technology from the UK aims to reduce deforestation by sowing seeds faster and more efficiently than ever before. While the alley cropping technique in Central America replaces slash and burn agriculture by planting rows of Inga trees. This creates healthy soil, allowing crops to be cultivated in the alleyways. In Trinidad and Tobago, 
The roots of the vetiver plant, which can be over seven meters long, bind to the soil to prevent landslides. Solutions like these are vital to help us protect the land, but more important still is that we limit our consumption of natural resources. The future of our planet depends on it.